Today, Tony and I are going to talk about all of the factors that go into getting the sharpest possible pictures. The first thing that I want to start with is extremely simple, and that's to make sure that your gear is clean. So many times people have smudge marks on their lens, on the front or back, or they have a ton of sensor dust, and so you can just do a quick check and make sure that's not the problem. Another big point is to make sure you have enough light. So often people don't realize how low of light they're shooting in because your eyes just naturally adjust in a low light setting. If you're in a low light situation, make sure that your aperture is wide open. That's a small number like one, four, and make sure you're letting in as much light as possible. And that's gonna put less noise in your photos and make them cleaner and sharper. To demonstrate, I'll take a picture with a strobe with plenty of light and one without, and you can see the difference. So you can see that the photo with less light uses a higher ISO and as a result is getting more noise and doesn't look quite as sharp. So adding light will make your photo sharper. But it's not just how much light you use, it's the quality of the light that you use. So nice hard light like a strobe like this or like a bright sunny day will give you extra sharp looking photos. And that's great for wildlife or a portrait of someone with perfect skin, but sometimes it's nice to have that soft light from an overcast day. So be mindful of how much light you have and the quality of the light. I want to talk about shutter speed next because it's tied into light and this is where things get a little tricky. If you don't have enough light, you open up your aperture to try to let in as much as possible and then you try to make your shutter speed longer to let in more light. And that can be fine if nothing's moving, but a problem that I always run into is I start to get camera shake. If my shutter speed is too long and I start moving or my subject starts moving, then you're eliminating all that sharpness of the light because you're getting too much motion in your photo. You're going to have to figure out what shutter speed works best. And you can do that by starting off on a higher shutter speed, like 1 2 50th, and then working your way down to see how low your shutter speed can get while still keeping a sharp image. So there's a little bit of trial and error involved. When taking your shutter speed into account, think about your subject because kids are more wiggly than adults and you might be more wiggly than the average person. I know that I tend to move a lot and I need to crank up my shutter speed more than Tony, who is apparently like a statue or something. I don't know how he does it. I'm gonna have him wiggle so we can demonstrate. Is it possible, Tony? Channel the inner child. Never do that. Damn, you're so wiggly. Calm down. This might be when you bribe the child. I don't think that there is a shutter speed that can freeze you when you're doing whatever it is you're doing. <laughs> We've talked about the amount of your light, the quality of your light, your shutter speed, and now I want to talk about aperture because it seems like everyone just wants the largest aperture possible. It can kind of screw up your portraits and it can make them seem out of focus. It's because sometimes the depth of field is razor thin. You can have just the eyelashes in focus or your model can be turned to the side and you get your back eye but not your front eye. Often people try to use a really low aperture number for a group photo and people in the front are in focus and people in the back are not. With group photos, you can only ever have one person in focus. So have rear rows lean in towards the focal plane. Really small aperture numbers aren't ideal sometimes. And sometimes you have to close down your aperture and make your depth of field deeper and get more of your photo in focus. And your picture will look sharper because of it. I'm shooting at f1.4 and I'm gonna have Tony just turn your head a little bit and I wanna show you how with this shallow of a depth of field, I can get just his front eye in focus and not his back. So I will go to f5.6. And you can see, even though I'm not at 1.4, the background is still blurred. Tony's sitting about three feet from the background. You can control blur by just pulling your subject away from the background. And at 5.6, he looks really sharp. Everything's in focus. You're not really missing out on anything by closing down your aperture. I know that this is so much information to cover in just one video, but we do have an entire book on the subject called Stunning Digital Photography. And chapter five is the portraits chapter. We talk a lot more about these things, far more in depth. We talk about posing, we talk about light, we talk about everything. We talk about everything. Now Tony has some points he's gonna make, so we're gonna swap spots here. Okay, give me that camera. One of the biggest problems I see is simply missed focus. So let's make sure your focusing system is set up correctly. 
I always use a single focusing point, not a group focusing point, and put it on the nearest eye. If you have eye detect autofocus, that's a good thing to use. Instead of AFC, AFS tends to be a little more accurate, but if your camera has a really good continuous focusing system, AFC might be good enough. If you're doing really close up headshots with really shallow depth of field, it's possible for your focusing system to focus on a brow or an eyelash and for the depth of field to be so shallow that it still looks out of focus. Let's take a test shot. So see there, the camera focused on something, but I really wanted it to be focused on the iris of the eye. The way to overcome that or to overcome focusing on glasses for glasses wearers is to put your camera in continuous shutter and then shoot continuously while leaning in. So let's try that again. If you have some budget or maybe you're a working professional and you want to be able to sell your clients large prints, upgrading your gear is the next step to producing really detailed, beautiful results. Let's see what it looks like to compare a professional lens with a 60 megapixel camera against a 24 megapixel camera with a kit lens. Oh, good. I bet you will. Hey, you made it to the end of the video. I guess you're pretty serious. Why not check out our professional portrait photography training? This will teach you how to actually make money with your photography. We'll show you the business and technique of portrait photography. And if you're not happy with it, we'll just give you your money back. Don't forget to subscribe for tons more free videos and to check out our book, Stunning Digital Photography. It's only 10 bucks. Thanks. Shallow depth of field can be good as heck, but with group photos, you need a deep depth of field. Please help me, I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a group photo and you need people in the background with focus, have them lean in. Oh, I'm so scared. I'm gonna do that sequence again, Wiggle. I hate it so much. <laughs> I don't like it at all. <laughs> Stop. Oh no.